Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So welcome to confirmation class today. We're talking about the Annunciation. So I'm curious to know if any of you even know what that means to begin with. <laughs> what is the Annunciation and what does that mean? Um, but you'll learn. So we're going to start the big idea for this class is that Gabriel's good news for Mary is also good news for us. With God, all anything is possible or all things are possible. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard that statement before. So we'll start with our quiz show and see if how you do with these. So say multiple choice. So the news of Jesus' birth that the angel Gabriel shared with Mary is known as this should be pretty obvious. Okay, it's not the press the digitation. It is the Annunciation. Okay. Gabriel made the announcement to Mary by fax machine, instant messaging, speaking directly to her, speaking through a megaphone, or playing charades. What do you think? Speaking directly to her in person. Yeah, Gabriel showed up. When Gabriel announced that Mary was pregnant with Jesus, Mary's response was, that makes me so happy. Let me tell Joseph, Gabe, you are kidding me. I can't wait to buy blue outfits. How or how can this be since I'm a virgin? Which one? Maybe she was excited to buy blue outfits. I doubt it. But Or, Gabe, are you kidding me? <laughs> but really, the answer is, how can this be since I am a virgin? Mary is a remarkable figure for Christians because... She was the mother of Jesus. She sang a song called the Magnificat. She responded to Gabriel in the end with faith, and she became a follower of Jesus. Or all of the above. Definitely all of the above. Like angels throughout the Bible, Gabriel responds to Mary's fear with these words. Gotcha. <laughs> Boo. Snap out of, excuse me, snap out of it. Do not be afraid, or I am so, so sorry. <laughs> do not be afraid. The angels almost always say, do not be afraid in the Bible when they're talking to people. Gabriel assures Mary of her pregnancy by telling her she will receive the gift of, what, medical care, <laughs> a year's worth of diapers, which would have been probably handy, the Holy Spirit, a nanny, or birth coaching. <laughs> The Holy Spirit. <laughs> Gabriel also tells Mary about the extraordinary pregnancy of her cousin Elizabeth. It's extraordinary because Elizabeth is young, old, in college, not in love with her husband, more into fashion than babies. <laughs> Definitely not the last one. <laughs> she was very, very old. But do you, one question is, do you know who Elizabeth was pregnant with? like who her child was. Elizabeth is um, was Mary's cousin. Her and her husband, Zechariah, uh, were very, very old and she got pregnant and um, her son was John the Baptist. In Gabriel's announcement, Jesus' family tree is linked to Adam, Noah, Methuselah, Harrison Ford, or David. <laughs> Harrison Ford, definitely. Definitely David. And Mary's final response, here am I, the servant of the Lord, may be seen as something a typical teenager would say, a statement of faith and trust, a way to get rid of Gabriel, an example of Mary's trust in the good news, or B and D. Usually when there's an option like that, that's usually the uh, So we'll begin with our opening prayer. So uh, I will say the parts in white and I invite you to respond with the parts in yellow. With you, God, nothing is impossible. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Thank you for Mary's faithfulness. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Help us to be surprised by the good news of Jesus. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. With you, God, nothing is impossible. Amen. So here's our cartoon for the day. So just enunciated, Bethlehem or bust. <laughs> um, so before we get to the question, we're, I'm just going to share some of this uh, 
the lesson with you. So in this account, we'll read this in a little bit, but the in Mary's time, women did not have a whole, whole lot of rights uh, at all. Uh, and they didn't hold prominent roles. They didn't take uh, prominent roles in anything. And uh, especially in marriage, uh, marriage was not seen like we see it. I mean, we, we often or almost always see marriage as a two people fall in love and then they get married. In that culture during in Mary's time, that was not at all the case. It had nothing to do with love. Often the two people getting married didn't even know each other at all or barely. It was more of a business transaction to unite families and things like that. And the girls, because they weren't women, <laughs> girls when girls were promised in marriage to uh, men who were often very a lot older than them um, the parents chose who they were going to marry and the girls would get married around age 13 or 14 so if you think about that you all are the age that the girls you'd be getting married so think about that for a minute <laughs> that you'd be getting ready to get married um, and you'd be marrying somebody that you hardly knew and would be generally a lot older than you, which was the case with Mary and Joseph. He was significantly older than her. And um, so again, and but at the time that was normal. So Mary would not have been upset by that or confused or any of that. She, that was the expectation and she would have trusted her parents to choose somebody good for her and for the family. And so she would have just, gone along with it. I mean, it would never have been something that she would have questioned uh, because that was the norm back then. Uh, but the other thing that the important part to remember too about Mary is that she was just an ordinary girl. There was nothing special about her. She was not unusual in her family or her culture, her town. She was in a little town, much like Custer, that's small. Uh, and she was just a normal 14 year old girl. There was, you know, she had not done anything to uh, seemingly to draw any kind of attention to herself. She was just going along with her life like a normal 14 year old girl. Um, so <laughs> then she had this bizarre thing happen to her. Um, so she's in her her room, uh, supposedly, and this the angel Gabriel appears to her and says these crazy things about having a baby. And she says, of course, you know, in shock, well, how could that be? I'm, I'm a virgin. I've never had sex. I've never, I'm not married yet. I mean, how is this supposed to happen? And um, that's when the angel tells her it's the Holy Spirit. And Mary could have said, nope, <laughs> don't want to do it because not being married yet, but being promised to Joseph, being pregnant was a huge, I mean, that was a major, major issue for her and for her family and for Joseph. She could have been rightfully and lawfully killed for it. She could have been put to death for becoming pregnant before she got married. Uh, that was, it wouldn't have been unusual. And so it would have brought a, a lot of disgrace on her and her family. And it would have affected her family financially too, because if she was in disgrace, then her family was in disgrace and people wouldn't do business with them and all of that. And of course, Joseph, what would Joseph have thought? If his fiance got pregnant and he knew it wasn't him, well, he would have assumed she'd had an affair or cheated on him, right? So it would have been natural for him to just you know, dismiss her and get rid of her and be done with her. Um, and he could have done it in a very public, humiliating way, but he chose not to because the angel visited him in a dream too and told him what was going on. And so he did not get rid of her. He didn't dismiss her. He didn't let go of her. He followed what God told him to do as well. Um, even though it would have been humiliating for him too, um, as people would have thought that he knowingly took this either, either he was lying and he had sex with her and got her pregnant, you know, and humiliated the family, or he knowingly was going to marry somebody that he knew cheated on him. So either way, it made him look bad. So, um, they both took a chance and trusted God, 
um, in this whole thing. And, um, you know, the only way that it could be explained is that God gave them the strength and the courage to do the, to, to do what God called them to do. So that's where the question it comes in. When did you have the courage to do something you never thought you could do? Has there been a time in your life when you've done something that um, took more strength and courage on your part than you, you know, would have thought um, to do something you never thought you could do? Whether it was talk to somebody, a stranger, or um, you know, the guys asking a girl out, or a girl asking a guy out, or uh, going out for a sport you didn't think you could probably do, or I mean, anything. And so I, I'd love to hear from you if you've done those. Excuse me, I'm very thirsty. Uh, so now, here's our Bible connection. So I'm going to read from Luke, but it would be great if you had your Bibles out and handy, um, or you could find it in your Bible at, and read along with me. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, read the story starting in verse 26, like it says, about the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary, or pledged to the married a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Uh, I'm going to stop there and we'll um, continue in a little bit. So in this story, so who are the characters in the story? Um, mainly it's Mary and the angel. <laughs> There's not a whole lot. I mean, other people are mentioned, but um, so the announcement, of course, is that Mary will have a, a child um, in this extraordinary way. And the question of how does how does Mary respond is first she responds in fear. Um, she's greatly troubled, understandably. If so, an angel showed up in your house, in your bedroom, you'd be understandably afraid too, <laughs> and confused and all of that. Um, but in the end, Mary responded in faith and said, um, you know, may it be as you have said. Um, and how does God's promise come through? So, the question for that, you know, how does God's promise come through in this story? I mean, it's it's all about the angel announcing the promise. Um, so you'll have to, as we continue with the story, you'll have to think that through a little bit. And then we have the Magnificat. So that's the second part of this. So when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, um, she bursts into song. So I'm going to read that part. So this starts with, uh, verse 46. No, 39, sorry. <laughs> At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has come, who has believed what she has, I'm sorry. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. 
And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So just so you know, I'm reading a different version of the Bible than you probably have at home, or maybe not. Um, normally we read at church from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. That's typically the ones that we use in the Lutheran Church. Um, the one I have at home at the moment is the New International Version. So the words I'm reading, if you're following along with your Bible and it's a different version, the words may be slightly different. So uh, it'd be interesting to hear from you if yours is different and what that difference is and uh, which one kind of you like better. So this is the Magnificat. This is what's called the Magnificat. We actually have a lot of hymns and songs based on this. Um, so you might have, some of those words might be familiar. So in this Magnificat, the poor are lifted up and the mighty are cast down, um, which is a reversal of what reality is for the world for the most part. Um, so what in Jesus ministry shows his care for those on the margins of society. So if this Magnificat that Mary proclaims is about the poor being lifted up, what in Jesus ministry shows that he did the same thing and he believed that and he worked for the poor. So can you think of examples of Jesus um, in his ministry and his teaching and doing things that uh, you know he lifted up the poor and the marginalized and all of that. Um, and then how does the church minister to those who are outcast and most in need? So can you think of examples of ways that we at CLF help those in need or maybe the larger church? You know, we're part of the South Dakota Synod. We're part of the nationwide um, evangelical Lutheran church in America. Are there things that we do? And are there things that you do? And maybe you personally or things in your family that you do to help support those in need? I'd love to hear that as well. Um, what are we doing here? Oh, this is the science connection. So this is a, something I'd like you to just do and tell me what you what happens. So you take a piece of paper and roll it up into whoop, just roll it up into a tube like that okay and with both eyes open you hold your tube against your right eye and then hold the palm of your hand against your left hand against the tube in like the middle of the tube and tell me what you see tell me what happens um, see if something happens to your hand. <laughs> That's really what I want to see. Um, it's just a, a way to show something unexpected uh, and something, it's, it's called an optical illusion. Um, things that seem to be one thing, but then appear to be something else. Um, God often works like that, <laughs> that uh, things that appear to be um, reality in, are really not, or things that um, seem impossible with God are not impossible. I mean, like God said, all things are possible. That's what the angel said. All things are possible with God. So I'd like to hear what you find with that. So here are some questions I'd, li I'd like to have you ponder and, and share with me. So what surprises you about the story of the Annunciation? Um, how do you, and well, let me see what the other questions are. I don't remember. <laughs> That's one. Give an example of God at work in your everyday life. So this is an important one for me is, you know, God works like through Mary. You know, Mary was an ordinary, regular girl and God worked through her. And there's stories throughout the Bible of God working through normal, regular, everyday people. So that means God works through you, too. 
So I'm curious as to how you see God working in your life. You know, how do you see, or do you recognize God working in your life? You might not, um, but think about it. Think, think about how you think God might be working in your life or uh, guiding you in your life and directing you or leading you in your life. Um, I'm really interested to hear what you think about that. And in what ways do you share hope that the poor of the world can be lifted up? So that's another part of being a, a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, is to share the hope that we have in, in Jesus and to share Jesus' belief that, uh, or his passion for helping the poor and helping those marginalized and those who are oppressed, is that we carry that mission up on you know we're the carriers of his mission and so in what ways do you share the hope that the poor of the world can be lifted up uh, some of that could get back to how how do you see the church working um for the poor and then and then those in need um what again one of the things is that mary was just an ordinary girl working um just doing her living her life and then this angel appeared and changed her whole <laughs> changed the whole history of the world really um so you know again how are you part of god's plan because you are you we're all part of god's plan in the world so what role do you play in that how do you see god using you um to further his mission uh, you know, and what new thing might God be doing through you? Because each of us are unique. And so based on who you are and your unique personality and your gifts and the things you're good at and passionate about, how is God using you? What new thing is God doing in the world through you? Because God is. We just don't always recognize it. Um, and I want you to recognize that you were an important part of God's mission and ministry in the world so this is our closing ritual so i will again read the white and you read the yellow we thank you O oh god for the faithfulness of mary my soul magnifies the lord we thank you O oh god for the announcement by gabriel nothing is impossible with you we thank you O oh god for the ways you came down in jesus you are the lord the messiah with you, God, nothing is impossible. Amen. And now here's your blessing for the day. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Nothing is impossible with God.